Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. You know, one of these times, I have a feeling that Jeff is going to, like, not really do the intro, and uh, he, he will cut to us dancing. Oh, God. Uh, one of these times that would be awful. Usually it's you dancing though, so I'm yeah. not too scared. No, he's gonna do he's gonna do it on this one. Probably I don't know. Let's yeah, see. Jeff, don't do it. Uh, dancing. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back. It's episode 126. I can't believe we've done 126 plus more of these. Uh, today's April 16th, 2019, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. Hello, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're not. Go on YouTube and subscribe because we're almost there. <laughs> we're almost there. We get, we've we been saying like, this for a couple weeks. We need like fifteen more, <laughs> we, yeah, something like that. A couple more. Um, hey, we we. Ha- I'm your host. I don't know if I said this. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined with Mr. Blake <laughs> Arnsdorf. There he is. We've done too many podcasts we've, today. Apparently, we've done way too many things today. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, we got a lot to talk about today, though. Uh, in the news, it's a little bit of slower news week, so I guess not that much to talk about. But we will be talking about tracking phones uh, using Google for the police. Um, Tests on astronaut and twin brother highlight space flights, human impact, and wearable device scrubs cancer scales. <laughs> scales? scales? Too many, Get rid too of the many scales. Cancer cells from the blood. We've there, been there too many, too many podcasty things today. So I'm stumbling over my words. But it's okay. I think it went well. Uh, hey, yeah, like I said, you can go like, subscribe, YouTube, uh, do it now. You know, just take just take a minute. Just pause the podcast. Go, go. We'll uh, be back. We'll be we'll, here when we'll you be get right back. Here. We'll, or you can finish the rest of the episode online. That's fine too. Um, so we are here on a Tuesday because of reasons. I uh, <laughs> of reasons. <laughs> we'll get, we'll we'll get, get to, to those, those in a moment. We'll get to those in a moment too. We're doing hey, a lot of things later in the show. We are, but no, we'll get that. Well, so the podcasty things. We're doing a lot today. You know what we did today, Blake? What did we do, Nick? Oh, we did something super exciting. So we actually did this uh, HFES um, Ergo X webinar. So it was a preview of the 2019 Ergo X Exoskeleton Symposium. And we kind of took a look at exoskeletons in the workplace and beyond. Uh, it was really cool. So we had a bunch of prepared questions. We asked this panel of amazing folks. Uh, Chris Reed, who some of you might recognize as one of the names on the um, on uh, one of our old uh, HFES 2018 coverage uh, interviews. Yeah, so we he, did an interview with him and, what was it, Dave Rimple last year? Yeah, we did Dave Rimple. Uh, Bill Morris was on there. Um, Hung Wei Show was on there. And Don Peterson. So a, a, a star-studded cast of... Uh, exoskeleton experts, and it was it was really cool to kind of sit down with them and, and uh, you know check out uh, what they're doing and and what we can look forward to with Ergo X this year, which I may not be able to attend. We'll we'll see, um, but might have some stuff going on personally. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's it's interesting. So that was fun to do. Uh, if you are an HFES member, you should be able to go and check this out. I think they said within twenty four hours is usually when they have it up. Uh, if you're not an HFAS member, you might have to wait a little longer. I think we're going to try to pull some strings and, and be able to push it out on our podcast feed so everyone can listen to that. Um, also, keep an eye out just on uh, HFES, HFES's social media in general because they said they might even use some of it for marketing materials. Yeah, so you we'll can see. hear f- some tidbits about it. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So, so keep an eye out for that. Um, so, Blake, <laughs> I mentioned that I was. Uh, we didn't have a podcast on Monday, Nick. No, we didn't. You why, know why? why did we not have a podcast on Monday? Oh, so there's this little thing called Star Wars Celebration. Um, Zoom in here. Yeah, so I'm I'm sporting my uh, Darth Vader polo today. Uh, so uh, Star Wars Celebration is uh, kind of like Comic Con, but focused solely on Star Wars. And there was a lot of news coming out of there that you know me as a Star Wars fan. Uh, I, I needed a lot of calming down this weekend. Like, I, there, was, there was a lot of things that happened that I'm like, oh, so much. And it was information overload. So literally my, my Thursday through Monday was just me sitting on the couch watching this eight-hour live stream every day where, you know, they'd show a panel and then they'd bring out guests from the show. And, um, you know, I, I got kind of cabin fevery, but at the same time, it was all content that I enjoyed watching and, like, I don't know. I, I can't wait to go back next year because it'll be in Anaheim, so we're you know right down the way from us. Yeah, uh, I was telling a couple of other people about that today, and I I really want to go because you're the yes. first person to introduce me to Star Wars Celebration. Like I didn't know that was a thing yeah. until probably I met you. Yeah, and it's so what Star Wars Celebration feels like to me uh, to bring it back to Human Factors is kind of like HFES, right? Everyone's there to talk about one thing: Human Factors, and you know there's offshoots of Human Factors. There's medical. There's transportation. There's uh, exoskeletons, right? Virtual reality. There's all these different uh, kind of splinters 
And you can kind of think about Star Wars the same way, right? There's the TV shows, there's the movies, there's the comics, there's all these other avenues in which you can kind of talk, but it's all Star Wars and it's all connected. And same with human factors, right? And so it's just, it's making me excited for HFES, which I may not get to go to this year uh, for reasons we'll talk reasons about later. at some point, yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, it's still such a cool thing that they did. I mean, allowing people to sit at home and watch a lot of it on YouTube. Like we talked a little bit earlier about the experience you had where, of course, yeah. they're going to cut out some of the stuff just to like make it special for people at the event. Yeah. But that was such an awesome thing for them to do, especially with like how wide of an audience that Star Wars reaches. Yeah. And honestly, as I was watching it, like I don't know if you, if any our listeners are fans of Star Wars. I hope so. Um, if you are, please, please, please talk to me. I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything. Like Mandalorian, you know, uh, the Rise of the Skywalker, uh, a lot of Nerd. stuff. Nerd. Uh, yeah. So you know, hit me up on Slack. Uh, but <laughs> I will say, like, this was kind of. Uh, I wouldn't say the model for what I wanted to do at HFES, but I mean, think of how cool it would be if we like, you know, got to stream some panels and then after the panels, we came out and interviewed some of the people from the panels and then we cut to another panel and then it's just like this live streamed event, right, at HFES that, you know, if you're a member, maybe you watch it it, it, live or whatever. If you can't be there, you can at least like keep it on on your work computer and just watch remotely uh, and kind of get in on some of these high, uh, high profile panels like the keynote speaker or something like that, you know, like things to get everybody excited. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like what it, to, to steal Chris's analogy from earlier. It's like the unicorn model of what you would want from any conference that you go to, especially HFES where it's such an international society and you don't get a whole lot of people that are all always able to either travel within the States or even outside the States yeah. to come to it and experience what's going on or even interact with some of the panels kind of similar to what we did today with the webinar like being able to ask questions during yeah. the webinar virtually without having to be there yeah that was really cool you guys okay so i don't know if you've ever done a webinar this is my first webinar this is really cool so they give you the tools Ooh. they give you the tools so we had about what like 30 plus people watching live yeah and um you know they were able to ask questions in the moment based on the things that we were talking about and we were thinking about like, how cool would that be for the show if we could do that on a weekly basis, right? Like sometimes we record on Mondays and sometimes it's not always at the same time. But if we could do a live show, if enough of you show interest in that, that that could be absolutely something that, you know, I, I think with webinars, it's a little different. They're far and few between. Um, but I mean, we know how many of you listen to the show. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, like, let us know. We'll, we'll explore that option. But I thought it was so cool because we could talk about something and we could, you know, kind of expertly weave these questions into some of these prepared questions that we had. And it kind of flowed nicely. And it was it was really cool. Yeah, I think that was probably my favorite part of the webinar is just the interaction from people that are watching it and knowing that, like, not just the number on the screen is all you're going to get in terms of knowing how many people are watching, but actually having people ask really good questions. And yeah. the panel is being really excited to just even write textual answers to people quickly. So there, I don't know. There's a lot of insightful things that came out of doing the webinar with the exoskeleton guys. Yeah. So um, there, yeah, we, I think there, we couldn't even get to all the questions, the, the prepared questions that we had. I yeah. Mean, which, I, which I felt good about because yeah. I wanted to make sure that it was like a, a kind of a fun and free flowing conversation. And you asked a lot of great questions that were a little more off script that like, like asking about what movie do you yeah. think rep best represents exoskeletons? Oh, you know, I got to bring out my nerd and Chris really got going there with, with the nerdy thing. Well, <laughs> the best part was, uh, I forget who it was. It was, Bill. It, it was Bill that brought out like alien th- from aliens, yeah. the corny weaver. That was too good. Yeah. All oh. right. So anyway, this, this whole thing to say star Wars celebration, that's why I was out on Monday. That's where I was this weekend. I was just sitting on the couch, vegging, watching star Wars content and thinking about how we can maybe do that for HFES. Cause that would be, that'd be super cool to bring something like that. For We're going to get there. I, I hope so. I think we can. Uh, yeah. If, if that's something you guys want to see, let us know. I mean, the more we can... So we have a connection with some of the HFES leadership that we can actually reach out to and uh, say, hey, you know, some some listeners of the show actually have this idea and they want to see this. You know, the the more evidence that we can bring forward, you know, I can screen cap your, your thing on Slack and just say, hey, look, this person wants this. Uh, and the more of you we have, the more we can come forward and say, this is something they want. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, it w- it's it's like user research. We we all know certain things to be true, but we have to have the user data to really get somebody to buy off on it. Anyway, it's that's, how we do our jobs. Yeah. So, what's going on in Blake's world though cuz it's I I here I've been blabbing about Star Wars and Ergo X. Your and favorite. Yeah, Nick and I sat here and nerded out for a little <laughs> bit watching some of the Star Wars stuff that I missed. Uh, so I don't I don't know if anybody that listens to the podcast or and Nick, I don't really think you are, but 
I'm a big kind of fight fan, and so watching the UFC and different fights on the weekends is something that I like to do. And recently, they have signed a deal with ESPN to basically, instead of having pay-per-view buys on on like your TV or through any kind of service like Fox sure. Sports, they're going to have it all streaming through ESPN's app called ESPN+. Plus. Okay, so, so, so the model's changed now from you buy fights that you want to see to now you pay a subscription service and you can watch anything you want? Exactly, yeah. So okay. you can watch like past fights, you can watch upcoming fights, you can watch like stuff from EBI that comes out. There's just a, it's a lot of great features in like the UFC. I think it's the best move for the UFC financially and getting the sport to be bigger in terms of MMA and jiu-jitsu. But anyway, so that, over the weekend, there was just a horrible miscalculation. And I think this happens with a lot of products that get launched. I'm not trying to overly be mean to ESPN. But over the weekend, it was really hard for people to get into ESPN service and make it st- and actually access its streaming service. Is that because they didn't like do load there testing? There was way too many people that were trying to access it. So that's probably a good thing in that a lot of people are trying to adopt it. But okay. at the same time, like one of the big commentators in the in the, or one of the big kind of like UFC U, <laughs> UFC advocates, Brendan Chop, was talking about like as soon as he put it out on Twitter that he couldn't get into ESPN Plus, he had at least two thousand links to like illegal downloads or illegal ways to watch it. Okay. Let me ask a couple follow up questions. Do it. So one, did this service just get implemented? It's it's relatively new, so the deal's only gone through probably in the last month. Okay, and so this would be the biggest fight that they've even put on so far. So okay. you're going to experience some hiccups, and depending sure. on how you're streaming it, like a lot of the problems ended up being like through people's Apple TVs and how that all right. worked. So there's, there's a lot of like process management steps that come along with that, but I think there was a lack of kind of like load testing or projection of how many people were really going to jump on this. Huh. Okay, that makes me nervous for a couple of reasons. I, I know I feel like I'm super interested. It's not because of fighting. It's not because of ESPN. It's because Disney owns ESPN. Yep. And Disney is launching their own streaming service, which looks amazing, by the way. Like seven dollars uh, compared to Netflix's thirteen. Oh, uh, Netflix. And you get access to all of Disney Fox's library. like and So anyway, on the day the streaming service launches, you're going to get The Mandalorian, which is uh, a live-action Star Wars TV show. We talked about this before. That's going to be <laughs> way too epic, but I can't wait for any debacle that comes out of that. But the good thing is, is if they're... Since Disney does own ESPN+. That's Plus. the part that gives me hope, right? Is yeah. that this could be a load test for that event, right? Sports is a very subset, right? Disney whole library that's a whole separate story so who knows where it'll go yeah i don't know it's one of those things too because if you're thinking about mma and fights and stuff like that i can't i can't imagine the difference in scale that that means for stuff like just a, the disney streaming service or people that are just going to watch like the star wars show when it comes out that is a complete different order of magnitude i have a feeling yeah well i i'd imagine this kind of I, I'd imagine it all uses the same infrastructure that, you know, they're te- like this is almost serves as a test because it is a subset um, and they're just testing the technology. So that way, Disney streaming service can have a smooth launch. Do we know if this uh, ESPN service was globally or just the United States or what? Because Disney has this rollout like for, for their streaming gonna, service, yeah. you know, North America and then other countries afterwards. I really don't know if it is global or not. I would assume that it is because, I mean, People watch these fights all around the world mm. all the time, and they often happen in different countries and that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so so now you have me worried about Disney streaming service crashing on the first day when I can watch The Mandalorian. What was ca- <laughs> and that sucks because the idea of that is awful. And I was dying to watch this main card fight with Stylebender, and it was an insane fight to watch later. But at the same time, it's kind of an interesting problem that ESPN or Disney or any of these streaming services have to deal with because you're running. Th- trying to get through third party like basically applications or systems right and so you it's hard to account for that and provide good instructions yeah that's what i kept running into was like the instructions for each device wasn't really great and it, so each one had but like a kind of a different thing you had to follow to even like fix it well let me follow up with that too when you say instructions are you talking about like uh instructions on how to mitigate the streaming hiccups like yeah so as you were like experiencing issues it was like okay try reloading the website and then try reconnecting your device that you're trying to stream to 
And so there was just a lot of steps you had to go through to even get it to work. And, and they didn't have any of that infrastructure built into the app. It wasn't ready. And then there was a whole bunch of, like, you know, whenever anything goes wrong, just try restarting it. So restarting your account, all that kind of stuff. Have you tried restarting the computer? Yeah. yeah I've tried thing, turning right? it on off again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just how we go. But what can I say? I'm not the IT guy. Well, thanks for sharing. I, uh, I will for sure follow up on the Disney Plus streaming service. Which launches what November twelfth? So that way, that's oh, right this after this year. That's yeah, so crazy. That's right after HFES, folks. Um, so you can bet that I will be there first in line. All right. Well, Blake, it's been a week since we last visited Human Factors News. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on anymore. It's part of the show where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors. This could be space. Could be or Google or police. I'm doing or, a better job, I think, of, of actually capturing what we're talking about. You know, or it could be wearables that detect cancer. So, you know, it could be anything as long as it relates to the field of human factors and, uh, you know, w- we find it interesting. So, all right, Blake, we got three stories up this week. What do we got up first? <laughs> it used to be that it strikes communication in the, in the community. No, no, no. But now that's, it's just that's, interesting to us. That's Reddit. Oh, that's well, excuse right, yeah. me. I just, I, you know what? I, we've been doing this for so long. The sections blend together. And uh, I, it's all I led same. into Reddit. It's so, amazing. anyway. Yeah, <laughs> right into Reddit. All right, so first story. So we're tracking phones, and Google is now dragnet for police. So when detectives in Fe- a Phoenix suburb arrested a warehouse worker in a murder investigation last December, they credited a new technique with breaking open the case after leads had actually gone cold. So the police told the suspect that they had been tracking his phone data to the site where the man was actually shot nine months earlier. They had made the discovery after obtaining a search warrant that required Google to provide information on all devices all devices that are recorded near the murder scene, potentially capturing the whereabouts of anyone in that area. So the warrants, which draw on an enormous Google database that Google employees called the Sensor Vault, turned the business of tracking cell phone users' locations into a digital dragnet for law enforcement. So we obviously live in the era where it's ubiquitous to gather... <laughs> what was that word? <laughs> All right, let's try that again. So in an era of ubiquitous data gathering by tech companies, it is the latest example of how personal information, so things like where you go, who your friends are, what you read, what you eat and watch, and even when you do those things, is being used for purposes many people just really never expected. I don't want to see what things you're doing. I know, I don't either. So as privacy concerns have mounted among consumers, policymakers and regulators, tech companies have come together under intensifying scrutiny over the way they use our data and how they collect it. The Arizona case also demonstrates the promise and perils of this new investigation technique, who's who's used the sudden and sharp who's been <laughs> used suddenly and sharply over the past six months. And according to Google employees familiar with the request, it can help solve crimes, but it can also ensnare innocent people. There's an important part to kind of bring up about this act this particular case is the person they initially arrested turned out not to be the actual suspect. Yeah, but by the way, you wrote this. But I it, did. You, you you edited this this blurb, so absolutely. The, the reason why you can't read it is your own fault. It absolutely <laughs> is. So this is concerning, but also I, I don't know. Like once the technology is better, it should be okay. Like I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this, uh, and that kind of sounds weird coming out of my mouth, right? Where I'm okay with uh, police having access to this kind of data that can potentially, um, you know, help help them find these these folks, uh, because. Man, you, you committed a crime. You, you, yeah, I don't know. What, yeah, what, what are you thinking? I think, again, we're running into this kind of privacy policy problem where we didn't really know what we were signing up for. But in, in this case, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because it's it's great that police are able to use this information, and Google's very compliant in giving out warrants and access to the database. But at the same time, I think the more important point in this article is the fact that even though this was used and it was used to initiate an arrest, it ended up being that you couldn't just rely on the data from Sensor Vault to draw your conclusions. You really had to still do a lot of investigative work. So it's not as if the information is, can be used on its own. Yeah, it's not like it's just Google saying, yeah, he did it. He was here and there. You have to corroborate it with other evidence. That- yeah, which is ultimately what happened is this th- this kind of fell apart Like as they started going through and they had more people come forward and were able to arrest different people. But, I mean, it's a, at least a way to keep a case going when things run cold. Um, it is scary the amount of data they may or may not be able to have access to based on what you're doing. Like, as, like I don't know what you're consuming as a 
like whenever you look at your phone or what you're reading and then kind of draw conclusions about you based off of that. I mean, that's a that's a lot of jumping around without and entering into an investigation without even your consent behind it. Yeah, I don't know, man. Like I it it, it helps build a more full picture, right? Like let's say somebody is researching on how to do a heinous act before they do a heinous act. I'm not sure. going to say anything. I don't want to trigger anybody. Um but let's say let's say that happens, right? And if you can go back through somebody's like search history and location history and understand that, you know, the, the impetus of this idea, right? They saw it on a YouTube video. Well, then maybe we can actually trace it back to that YouTube video and punish that YouTuber as well because they can be in you know, like, you know, I don't know. I I I I feel I, I'm very conflicted because on one hand, yes, privacy is a huge issue. You should absolutely know what you're signing up for when you consent to privacy. But at the same time, if this helps people identify um, or not even identify, b- basically build the full picture. Like, um, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's it's tough, right? Because I, I, I find value in creating that full picture. And I, I like a lot of um, media, documentaries, uh, podcasts that will take different sources of information and synthesize it in a way that makes a full picture or, you know, in the case of documentaries, a picture that the um, director is trying to show you, uh, you know, because it's one perspective, but finding evidence that supports that perspective. But, uh, you know, if if you truly are supposed to be partial, then getting more data from the police side is not bad it's just the privacy issue right so i'm like i'm very conflicted i'm very conflicted on this yeah i'm much less concerned about how the police are using it because i mean ultimately back to the story it talks about that it was just basically another data point for them to keep a case open cool great i'm more concerned about the fact that this information is sitting somewhere and google has it and likely other companies have it and been collecting the information from your phone including your location trends on things you do that kind of stuff and how that's used or even sold against you Um, Because it's something we are consistently dealing with with different, like how ads are targeting you or how Facebook, you know, it shows you different things that that it should or shouldn't or whatever it may be. I mean, there's just a lot of implications if this amount of information is being collected on you and how it's used. It's one thing for, uh, like, the police to be able to get a warrant for it. That makes sense to me. But how's it being used otherwise? What are companies doing with it now to yeah. keep in track of you? Well, I know what they're doing for me is they're giving me 15 cents every time they see I go to a store and they say, hey, did you buy anything here? Can you take a picture of that? Nope. Oh, all right. Here's 15 cents. And then I can use it in my games and I'm on my way. There right? you go. You're hilarious. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I don't care because I'm not doing anything wrong. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know. And and I mean, I love earning Google credit points for a- answering yeah. all their questions. Yeah. I am the first person to do that when it comes up on the phone. I kind of enjoy it because they ask accessibility questions, so yeah. it's like my good deed for the day. And yeah, and I mean, like, I, and they pay you. Yeah, they do. So and, and dollars. And honestly, I feel like it's it's probably a generational thing, right? I feel like younger people are more okay with signing over their privacy because it's something that they grew up with. And I don't know. I certainly feel that way. And it's like. Yeah, they can create profiles. They can target me directly. Maybe I just don't understand the impact of that. I I don't know. Like, yeah, it could be that we just don't know yet. It's kind of like a lot. What's the longitudinal study going to show of data collected and used against you? Does it shape your behavior? Right. Does it turn you into a different person? And that where's kind of the stuff? line? Where, like, and they'll be able to identify. Uh, presumably, they'll be able to identify that line with me and not cross it, or they cross it once and don't ever cross it again. Right? Like. I think the line for me would be if I see myself in an advertisement wearing something else, like that might be, okay, how did they get that picture of me? How did they get that information? Who okayed that? Who sold it to who, right? But if it comes close, if if it's showing my demographic, right, people with glasses, people with brown hair, people with green eyes, like if they're showing that demographic in the glasses, I'm, oh, that guy looks like me. He looks good in that. I might look good in that too, right? Like that, that's not that line for me. And so, like, I'd imagine that they would start, uh, like, once you cross that line, I don't think you could go back because, you know, then then I would know, oh, yeah, no, he's wearing the same shirt I was wearing in another picture. And that's why, like, I know, you know, it's just, it. but then every other, you know, every other time they presented me with an advertisement or something, then I'd be able to say, I know what you're doing. You're pulling back because I was so, you know, and then they just have to keep pulling back. And maybe slowly reintroduce it. I don't know. There's a lot of crazy things you can do with people's data, especially when they're signing on. 
uh, without really reading the terms of service. Absolutely. But the second Amazon starts showing me using products, I know I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like, where is that line? And, and yeah, this is just another... another uh, Just another day in human factors land. Another thing. All right. We got another story. What's up next, Blake? All right. So in a landmark study, NASA scientists conducted exhaustive tests on Scott Kelly during his grueling 342-day tour abroad the International Space Station in 2015 to 2016. And very simultaneously, modern his identical twin brother, Mark, a retired astronaut who was on Earth at the time, hoping that the comparison would reveal new information about the effects of long-term space travel on the human body. The results of the NASA twin study reported last Thursday in Science show that Scott Kelly underwent a number of physiological changes, most of which returned to the pre-flight status after he returned to Earth, and the findings could help inform preparations for future long-term missions, such as the travel to Mars or stints on a moon-orbiting space mission. The study was the first to integrate both behavioral analysis and physiological physiology to <laughs> investigate how space influences a person, and the first to collect two years of comprehensive health data on a middle-aged Earth-bound man. So this is definitely a great step for science, and in many ways, it's leveraging both something that's naturally occurring and trying to understand causality behind it. So I think this is kind of an interesting study, and also great genetics if both of you ter turn out to be astronauts, or right. great luck and fate. Yeah, so th this the, uh, this study's cool for a variety of reasons, right? So first off, they were... The astronaut in space, uh, forgive me. Um, astronaut in space, <laughs> that's a good start. The one in space, uh, let's see here. Uh, so that was Scott Kelly. Good old Scott. Good old Scott. So in space, he was actually, um, you know, providing these samples, right? It's, it, it, I think it seems like both of them are, are uh, collecting the blood samples from themselves, right? Is that... Is that yeah, they're both giving samples just to, I guess, test over the one-year period, I think it was. Compare, like, how they're, how the effects play, because I guess I'm not really sure how this works. It would be great to ask somebody who's actually a twin, but I think your physiology is very, very similar. In very. That, in that they're hoping to see, like, okay, basically Mark, who was on, who was on Earth, past, was the past astronaut, we will use him as a baseline for Scott and right. see how it how all of his kind of different parameters, whether it's for blood, urine, markers, whatever whatever they're looking at, how they pan out over a space flight. And it seemed like they came out with some interesting changes to his physiology that I don't think they expected. Yeah. So so they I, I don't know. Were they expecting the near constant physiological stress that Scott was experiencing? That I don't know. I, I, that almost sounds like you would exp you would expect it, right? Because you're traveling through space. You are traveling through space, but I'd imagine that like it's it's a it's a velocity thing, right? Once you once you have been in space for a, a while, that stress I would I would assume at least based on my you know completely um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for completely uh, I don't have I don't have a full view on it. I don't know. Say one more time. For. I I I I have no idea about biology and anything, but I would expect yeah. that you know uh, my naive view on on biology. I don't know. I would expect that you know stress would go down over time. Oh, you kind of think that maybe over t like in let's say a month or a couple weeks he would hit back into homeostasis yeah. or something like that. Yeah, like I I guess that makes sense. But what they're they're showing is something completely different, right? So his immune system was on high alert the entire time. He had that phys the physiological stressors that you mentioned the the whole time that he was in space flight. He actually was seeing it looks like some cardioid problems during space flight, and then he developed a specific neurological syndrome. Yeah, this one's interesting. All from fl all from just being in space. So so it's a it's a space space flight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS. So this is a condition that kind of involves changes to his eyes, um, for which the the cause is poorly understood. Uh, so that happened in space, right? And, and presumably, if they have the same genetics or, or very similar, right? They're twins, so similar phy physiology too. Uh, you would not expect that in uh, the one on Earth, but it's interesting that that one manifested itself in space. Well, well I wonder too if because if because Mark was the one that was still on Earth, but he had been a previous astronaut. So I wonder if there was still some, you know. Like maybe he experienced it, but didn't really report it until when they got back or something like that, or if maybe. he experienced some of the similar stuff. Um, 
I don't know, man. This is it's kind of insane too. Like even thinking about like how your body's blood flow in Ke- in Kelly's case didn't really even adjust that well. Cause, so he was still experiencing problems with getting blood fl- flow to his legs. I'm assuming because your body is trying to keep your brain as healthy as it can, so it's pumping all the blood to your brain. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. There was there was a lot of like obvious kind of like negative things that happened, but you've got a part highlighted that I think is super important. Yeah. So so uh, Kelly uses this quote. Um, your body adjusts to it over time, uh, being gravity, uh, or, or lack thereof, right? You adjust to a lack of gravity. But in my experience, it never adjusts completely. I always felt pressure in my head. Um, so, so this is kind of that constant, right? Like maybe this is what I was thinking is that, you know, you'd, you'd start to adjust and adapt and, um, you know, all these, all these symptoms would kind of even out and they just become the norm, right? When people live with chronic pain, it takes more for them to realize they have chronic pain, right? Until it's gone, in which case they go, oh my God, I didn't realize I have that. Um, and so, uh, so I, I feel like it's the same way, although he's cognizant enough to, to know that he always felt pressure in his head. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that, uh, man, I'm glad they were able to actually do this study because it's interesting to see just how much havoc it seems like spaceflight could wreak on your body. Um, o- and over time, who knows how much that impact is? Because this is just uh, just about a year of sp- of traveling to the ISS. Yeah. So this this last point here that I have highlighted, this one's really interesting because this is happening at a, a biochemical level. Um, you're familiar with DNA nucleotides that are uh, in that DNA. Um, they kind of cap the ends of each chromosome, like agents on a shoelace. I'm I'm reading directly, so forgive me, um, but these grew longer, uh, these, these telomeres. And so typically they shorten as we age, uh, but an enzyme called telomerase repairs and lengthens them, and astronauts are exposed to extreme stresses of microgravity, isolation, and radiation that should contribute to telomere shortening. Um, suspected that Kelly's highly regimented diet and exercise program aboard the ISS may have contributed to the lengthening. So it, it had the opposite effect of what they were expecting. They thought because he was in space um, and because he was stressed, they thought they would shorten, but they actually lengthened. Yeah, and this is really strange for me to read this in an article because telomeres have come up in a bunch of podcasts that I listen to about like strength and fitness and really focusing on anti-aging. And like trying to rekindle your telomere lengths is something that's supposedly really important to have like a longer lifespan and that kind of stuff. So it's interesting that in space flight, we're seeing all these negative consequences for, for Kelly in this case in terms of some of the physiological blood markers, all that stuff. But it, even due to these kind of crazy physiological markers and the impact of being a microgravity, his telomeres were lengthening instead of shortening, which is just almost backwards from what I would have expected. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And I wonder I wonder how they could continue thinking through that line of research. Like, what could we do on in Earth's atmosphere that could mi- maybe mimic that and start helping to, people, helping to lengthen people's telomeres that are getting older? I don't know. It's just a kind of a strange conundrum to come across. Yeah, I don't claim to know what telomeres are. Uh, I'm just reading the information for the folks, but... Um the fact that you could elaborate a little bit on it's better. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what this means. I don't know what we can do to, to um, study this further. But, yeah, I don't know. Any closing we need more twins. Any closing thoughts on the astronaut twins? I don't know. This is just awesome that two twins were astronauts and they were able to even conduct this study. I feel like that's a one in a million chance. Yeah, no kidding. All right, well, we'll be back to break down the other story right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. 
Thank you all. And remember, it depends. Blake, I don't mute the mic when we go on those commercial breaks. I don't know you why got, you don't. You got to stop Especially laughing. Especially after like two weeks of this. <laughs> you got to stop laughing. You got to stop breathing. <laughs> you can't. I just can't. No body functions don't, for me. Don't breathe at all. You just got to wait. Turn to a corpse. Uh, all right. So uh, before we continue, I just want to thank all of our friends at IEEE Spectrum, Scientific American, and New York Times for uh, all of our news stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us on social media or join us on Slack uh, for links to all the original articles. Um, yeah. Okay. So we got one more news stories. Uh, new story. Singular. I, I, English is hard. All right. Go. Go. Yes. All right. So a new wearable device tested on animals can capture and remove tumor cells circulating in the bloodstream. With further development, the blood filtering gadget could be used to diagnose and perhaps treat metastatic cancer in humans. So investors in the microfluidic device at the University of Michigan described it last week in the Journal of Nature Communications. And when blood is actually drawn from the vein, it's pumped through this device and it captures captures tumor cells, and then pumps the blood back into the body. So in addition to its envisioned purpose as a cancer treatment that filters out tumor cells, the microfluidic machine could be circulating tumor cells in the bloodstream. The researchers say that it could estimate the number of circulating tumor cells in the bloodstream as well, or characterize the tumor from which they came. The researchers hope that this increases the throughput of the device so that all the blood in the human body can be run through it two to th- in two to three hours. Nick, I never would have guessed that we would get some sort of device that could, at least in animals, just sort out tumors in your bloodstream and yeah. bring out cancer cells. Hang on, I just want to explain what happens when I prepare the blurbs. Is you, you They read a lot better. But yeah, they no, do. <laughs> you should do all of the show notes. Oh my god, so much work, Blake. All right, you, Absolutely, you, you guys have to understand how much work we put into the show every week. It's not like we just go out and find the news stories. You got to uh, take those news stories, you finesse and then them, finesse them so that way they read well on the show. And uh, anyway, no, yeah. basically, so that way Blake can read the words that you like to choose. Yeah, exactly. Microfluidic <laughs> device. Microfluidic. Uh, no, I think. Th- okay, so first off, let's restate this technology is in its infancy. It's still a long way out. However, it is breaking new ground with being able to. Um, you know, search uh, search the blood and spit the blood back out that's okay and take the blood that's not okay. And uh, one of the big drawbacks to this right now is that it can't be, it can't do the entire, what are you laughing about? What? Stop. <laughs> what are you doing? You just derailed the show, Blake. <laughs> I'm looking at you as I'm talking. Anyway, let me finish that thought and then you can tell me what you're laughing about. Absolutely. They, so the, the, the issue right now is that they can't basically take all the blood in the body and pull out everything that's bad. Um, and, you know, hopefully soon or, you know, somewhere down the line, they'll be able to do that. Why were you laughing? Oh, just because yeah, something you said was funny at the time. I'm not even really sure. Okay, but whatever. the fact that this can actually take your, and I'm, a, I'm not sure what animals this would test it on. If I was taking a guess, it's probably rats. But if you were able to get the entire system of blood to run through in about two to three hours in a rat, that's pretty hopeful being able to pull out, I don't know how many cancer cells, but I'm assuming it would probably be a lot. But the one thing that we don't know from the study, at least, or at least from what we've got here, is what does that mean in terms of the overall health of the animal later, or how would that translate to humans later? Is it likely that cancer cells, without being in the blood, are still proliferating or growing somewhere, or does it, and does it reduce the chances of cancer still popping up? I'm not really sure. Um, but nonetheless, it's awesome technology, and the fact that it's going to be a it's proposed as a wearable device that I. I guess a cancer patient could just walk around with it on right that's pretty amazing i mean that's, that's kind of cool right yeah, yeah, yeah. can you think about it you could literally almost maybe be at home and not have to be going going to the doctor or you know having to have uh what is it chemo brought to you or any of that kind of stuff yeah uh, so just to follow up on the animals this was actually tested with dogs with cancer interesting um, so, so that's a lot more blood volume yeah it is that's a, that's a lot of blood um and so uh let's see here they, they tested about one to two percent of the animal's entire blood value volume in two hours um. So you know that that, that actually captured about three to fi- three point five times as many tumor cells per millimeter of blood than was possible with a series of individual blood draws. Uh, so that is in itself awesome, right? Like that is a lot. That's 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 a lot of throughput for um this this device. And and so obviously the big pie in the sky for this is to be able to increase that throughput. And, you know, be, be able to slap it on a human and have it detect cancerous blood cells, um, 
you know, all and have the whole body kind of scanned in the course of an hour. That'd be that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, I know for certain types of cancer, even with the scan technology we have, sometimes it gets missed or overlooked. And something yeah. like this, like early on, because reading some of the bullet points you left in the blurb here, I mean, the the point here is is that cancer is actually spreading through your blood just from having it in your bloodstream at all. So if this is like an early kind of intervention, would really have a large impact on how people experience cancer or whether it proliferates through the entire body, whatever it may be. So there's a lot of kind of a lot of potential here for this specific type of device. And the fact that it was tested on dogs, I wonder what that because I don't know what the how analogous like dog biology or any of right. that kind of stuff is, but I'm assuming that if it's used as a good model, Hopefully that we'll start seeing this on at least being tested with it on some sort of market. Right. Now, the question I have, and I don't know if the article actually answers this. It's been a while since I read it. But uh, if where the uh, where the thing connects, I think it connects on the arm, right? Um, or at least it looks like that. You know, it goes goes through a vein. Yeah, I think that's that's where it's projected to connect on the human. Yeah. Because um, and the, and, they've got probably a little more, like, spec'd out stuff for what they want the human version of this to look like. Like, yeah. I think they wanted to incorporate, like, having app like an app functionality so the doctor can use it or you can be using it. Right. It plugs into your non-dominant arm and, and you just, you wear it and it just does its thing. Um, now I wonder, I, I, my very limited understanding of biology here, it is biting me in the butt twice in one uh, episode. Who would have thought, but like, wouldn't it make more sense to plug it in like right behind the head? Right. Where like, so that way, because brain cancer arguably is the worst um, because you are dealing with something that, once your brain, got, like, you know, your your brain is you. And Absolutely. So, like, if you plug it into your neck or your, your, like, neck arteries, right, and it's searching for things before it gets, or maybe it's too late at that point. I don't know. Like, I just don't know. Like, where's the most efficient place to put it? Because if you can protect your brain, like, I don't know how you feel about this, Blake, but, like, if I had cancer and it was, uh, you know, in a place that was, like, not my brain, like okay, cut it off. Whatever. Um, let's blast it with whatever. I'd be much more careful with my brain uh, because that is me, and I don't know how you feel about that. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> there's way I too, twitched at that one. Well, there, there's like way too many. There's way too many variables for me in that one because I've also I have also in the past like what two years gone through an experience with a family member of mine who's had cancer and seen right. what the impacts of treatment has done. And I don't necessarily know that I would put myself through any kind of treatment for it. You just kind of live? I would just live out what I had left to live out. Wow. And that's, and I know that's getting really far away from what this device is supposed to do. Um, but I think that's kind of, to answer your question, that's how I feel about it. Now, in terms of why it might not end up near your neck, I, if I was to guess, maybe it's easier to have something attached to your arm and you're still going to get a lot of blood volume yeah. versus if you attach something to your neck, I think there's a lot of vulnerabilities you start having to deal with with people moving oh, sure. versus in your okay. arm. That's right. that's my guess. I don't know. Thank you for educating me on my limited uh, limited knowledge of uh, biology. That's my assumptions. So who knows? It came from... It came from... All right, it's that time again to get into what we like to call here uh, as It Came From Reddit. Now, this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. This is where, you know, I don't mess up and say any community is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. All right, so, Blake, we got this big, massive... Uh, it's it's like this big, massive mega thread that this guy posted in um, this guy, Ergoral, ghoul uh, girl <laughs> guy or ghoul or girl sorry uh so it, it's this big mega thread that somebody posted in uh in on the human factor subreddit so which is awesome which is awesome and you know so i feel like these are directly applicable to us so there's seven questions here um let's do it so this is i have so many questions on the human factor subreddit by i love this name dink and flicka five m Give us a high five in Slack if you catch the reference. Dink and Flicka. All right. So uh, they go on to write, I am an undergrad student about to graduate with a bachelor's of science in psychology. I'm really interested in human factors, but I have so many questions. Uh, you don't have to answer all of them. We're going to answer every single one of them for you, Dink and Flicka. Yes. Promise. 
Uh, but if you have an answer for even one of these questions, I'd be so appreciative. Well, great. We're going to go above and beyond this one, Blake. All right, so number one here, uh, how much math do most of you use in your daily life? Okay, this is actually more than seven questions, guy. All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> this has got two alone. This has got two alone. Uh, how much math do you use in your daily life? Is it mostly physics? I have no, almost no background in engineering, and, uh, and I'm deeply worried about my abilities in these areas. Okay, Blake, tossing it over to you. Okay, answer number one, how much do you use math in your daily life? A whole lot. Uh, but it's not necessarily always related to my job. I feel like the math that I'm using right now is very simplistic. It's basically how big is a, what screen resolutions are we working at? How's that going to impact design? It's ratios and proportions. Yeah. It's not calculus. But again, it's a lot of like Google it and use yeah. the tools that you have on your laptop or your computer to kind of help you get through it. In terms of am I using mostly physics? Absolutely not. The last time I used physics was in aerospace engineering physics too. When I had to take a test on physics. Well, hang on. So people that actually use, who work on biomechanics, they might actually use physics. Sure. Yeah, on a daily it's basis. very possible that you right. could use physics. And you, it's good to understand the base concept of it. Absolutely. It, it, it kind of depends on, ah, there it is again. It, it kind of depends on what exactly you are working on, right? I, I'd imagine if you're working on something like an exoskeleton, I would imagine that, you know, understanding physics and fulcrums and... Uh, biomechanics in general. Bio, yeah, biomechanics in general and load bearing and, um, you know, uh, force and mass and all that stuff is really important for your job. Possibly, yeah. But I wouldn't let that stress me out about whether human factors is right for me or not. Because no. if, if that ends up being part of your job... You'll learn I, you, what's important. Yeah, you can learn what's important. Likely, there's a lot of tools that exist to help you kind of get past the initial fears of, oh, do I need to know all these physics formulas or how, you know, the center, how to find the center of gravity, that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot that can help you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's jump into question number two here. Do you need to know about programming and computer science to design the computer side of things? Uh, do you need a background in computer science or electrical engineering? You make me think this is like a, all these are very it dependsy. So it does depend. Number for number two, I think uh, one it's going to depend on what you're going to apply your human factors knowledge to. If you're going to do something much more biomechanical related, you might not necessarily need to know as much programming. But I think for anybody that's in human factors, user experience, whatever it may be, having a base level understanding of how programming works and a little bit of computer science background doesn't hurt. You don't need to be an expert in it. I think it just ultimately helps in being able to communicate with developers or programmatic people that you have an understanding of the thing you're working on. Um, in terms of electrical engineering, that's really going to depend if you're working on hardware systems. And yeah. again, you don't need a PhD or a master's level understanding of electrical engineering. I'd say like something you Google or stuff that you watch on YouTube could give you enough of a baseline knowledge to be you know dangerous in your job yeah a common misconception is that you need knowledge in both areas like we don't we don't know a whole lot about our domain except the things that are important to the people that we're working directly with and so you know there's this misconception that you need to know everything when really you just need to know enough to make uh recommendations for those folks um and you know in in the case of electrical engineering and computer programming i think the benefit to knowing more is being able to communicate effectively with people that do that as a full-time job. If you understand that moving this one piece of interface is going to cause a bunch more problems for the developers, then maybe come up with a separate solution so that way they don't have to do as much rework, but you get just as much um, effectiveness for the user. Yeah, I, I think one important point, if Dink and Flicka happens to actually listen to the show or hear this episode or hear some of these answers. The biggest thing to remember is when you're getting a degree in human factors, I feel like a lot of the important stuff is the methodology you end up learning. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, some of the psychology can aspects can very much apply. It helps you kind of understand people better. But the methods are really what is what's going to just set you apart from anybody else. And having a solid understanding of that is going to take you very, very far. I second that. All right. Uh, number three here. Do you actually implement designs or... Do you just research how people respond to the designs and give feedback? Is it almost like a team collaboration where you work closely with the person designing things, especially asking for those in aerospace or aeronautical side of things? So, Blake, you actually have experience in aeronautical. 
Absolutely. So it's definitely a team collaboration, uh, like Nick and I have kind of been back and forth thing about. I mean, it's not just you're the single human factors person. Likely you'll be working on a team, especially on these kind of bigger projects. And you'll be interacting with cross-discipline styles of people. So developers, maybe people that actually work on aircraft, the users themselves, which can definitely definitely is a wide variety of people when we're talking about aeronautics, everything from a pilot to an ATC to anything else. Um, and I, the, the first part of the question, again, it feels very it depends because we do uh, in traditional settings, especially maybe in aerospace where you might be running where you actually might be running simulation style studies. You're going to be listening to people's feedback, understanding how that really impacts either design or concepts of operations, whatever it may be. So you may be more research heavy, but on the same token, you could be doing interface design. Um, which is not just listening and responding to feedback. It may be actually coming up with a design, testing it, and then creating something completely different based off feedback that you hear. So you'll almost run the entire design cycle or the entire like design thinking cycle. Uh, but Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I think yeah, it depends. I, oh. I, I, I really do think, though, it kind of depends on what job you get. I, I, I've had roles where I've worked directly alongside uh, a prototyper, and that prototyper then... Um, you know, can can very quickly move pieces and parts of user interface uh, components or, you know, workflows that I can test in the moment and say, oh, yeah, that's not quite right. And then, you know, we, we, we've gone to users and actually pulled back that data and, and you know, we report it to people. And so it's, it's a lot, right? Like sometimes I am, oftentimes now, I'm designing a lot more interfaces. Um, however, I'm not actually like, high fidelity them. I'm kind of passing it off to a designer and they will make it high fidelity and make it look like it's a part of the system. So that way we're speaking the same visual language as the developers. Um, but, you know, a lot of the workflowy pieces are, are me. And, and so it, it just kind of depends. Um, I would say though, like at least in all my examples, it's been a very collaborative effort and I don't know if I've just been fortunate enough uh, to not have to throw it over the fence to other people, but um, as long as you can kind of foster that collaboration within the workplace, I think I think you'll be good off. Um, okay, number four here. Uh, if you work as a private consultant, do you work with a cohort of other psychologists as a firm, or is a private consulting mostly independent work? The, mm, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but uh, I'll take a crack at it. So when you're talking private consultant, I'm going to twist that in my brain to independent contractor, um, which I do work as an independent contractor for separate things that I do outside of my main nine to five. So in, in where you also work as a contractor. Yeah. Which <laughs> I also considered a contractor within the government. So Firm. on the bigger, in the bigger side of things, it's definitely working with other psychologists who, who like create the entire team that I work with on an internal sense. And then it's kind of wading our way through the world of the development team, whether that's like system engineers, developers, programmatic people. So lots of different opportunities to work with different types of people. And then on my own kind of side stuff that I do, it's either me working alone or me working again in a collaborate collaborative environment with recently it's been working with uh, specific entrepreneurs and then they're any developers they're using to try and create some of the products they're pitching um, but that's kind of it can go both ways. Definitely just depends on where you are. Hey, there it is again. Yeah, I don't have any experience myself working as a private consultant. Um, however, we are fortunate enough to work in a building full of human factors people, um, some of the some of which are, have been past guests on the show. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's this kind of wealth of knowledge that I feel fortunate enough to be around other people who have varying levels of expertise and in, in subjects that I have no idea how to even start. And, you know, they can leverage my experience as well. Um, and so it just kind of depends on the company and the culture. OK, we got three more. Number five, do private consultants have niches, niches or are they more general? I I've typically known people to be more in like a niche market um like a, like i know a lot i know a lot of independent contractors who work for companies that do and they end up doing like the formative and some usability tests for medical device companies right uh so that's a big thing i personally like specialize in kind in front-end design of websites so that's w something that i only focus on when i when i'm doing kind of independent contract work um, but i don't think you have to by any means you could be a generalist and just be tackling problems that need people need that people need help with like 
approaching startups to help them kind of figure out process management, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you can do both. Um, it just kind of depends on ah, there it is again. It just kind of depends on uh, you know what your interest is, and and if you have a very specific interest and want to gain that expertise in that area, then then do that. Or if you feel like uh, you want to just make yourself widely available for for some you know general practice, then then you can do that. Uh, this one, Blake, I feel like you can speak to a little bit more than me. How do you find clients as a consultant? Oh man, in this day and age, social media is the is the way to go. Like I've I've picked up two clients just through Instagram alone. Like people getting into my Instagram account, seeing that I'll like post stuff that's related to website design or whatever it may be. Slide into your DMs. Yep, slip into your DMs and offer you a job. Uh, so that having some kind of social media presence, whether it's through YouTube, podcast, w- whatever it may be, is really important for finding clients and finding a diverse set. Also, too, you can use a lot of services that exist. Like uh, like WeWork, I think, just bought a company. I can't remember the name of it. But it's there's a lot of companies out there that allow you to hop on, create an account, say this is my skill set and bid for jobs, which you can find remote jobs all over the place. Um, another way to go, and I think this is also super important, especially in your local area, is go to human factors related or UX related or society related meetups and um, conferences. Go talk to people, hand your card out, just yeah. make contacts. That's the best way to go. Yeah, great advice. Um, yeah, I, I echo all that. I, like I said, I don't have as much experience going out and finding clients, but uh, Blake, you sure do. Um, okay, number seven here. Are any human factor psychologists involved in commercial product design, or is that a different branch of psychology? Short answer, yes. Absolutely not. What? What are, they, what are they doing out there? Yeah, that we're definitely involved in that. Yes, absolutely, yes. If, if you weren't sure, Blake is being facetious, and yes. we absolutely are involved in that kind of thing. Um, again, kind of depends on the uh, client that you get, right? If, if you are going to be a private consultant or a private contractor, then um, it does depend on the, the contract and what the scope of your work is and all that stuff. But absolutely, there are people out there working on that stuff. So that way, um, you know, commercial product design, you, you're using uh, things like Facebook or maybe, I don't know, you're using things like Reddit. There are people at Reddit who are, you know, behind the scenes figuring out how to do that redesign that nobody likes. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so, commercial product design too. This could be even you know designing a physical product. A phys- well. yeah, absolutely. Any, Ergonomics, anything. So you you have a f- you have a free range of what you can really do with human factor psychology. Just because I mean the methods alone give you such a toolkit to tackle a lot of different problems. And like Nick said, you don't have to be a domain expert. You just have to find the right place that'll take you. Yep, find that right place. Well, I hope I hope we answered all of your questions, Stink and Flicka. All seven. All seven of them. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week. If you're a Patreon supporter, please stay tuned. We're going to be digging into uh, our uh, American Space Program Part, what, four, I guess? Program, is, yeah. Uh, Hidden Figures Part 1. For the rest of you, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at H-Factors Podcast. Uh, if you want to reach us directly, we have a new email, show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear want to support the show, uh, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon and joining us for that exploration of the human space, uh, the American space program. We no longer uh, have the right stuff. Yeah, we, we no longer have that right stuff. That right stuff is done. We're done with that movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, support us on Patreon. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Just got a facelift. Uh, I want to thank Blake Arnshaw for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about how to become a human factors practitioner? You can always find me at Don't Panic UX across all social media platforms, and but the best place to find me is definitely in our own Slack. Perfect. Special thanks to Jeff Olson for editing our video each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. Oh,